All right. So um, <clears throat> just to start off, uh, I want to acknowledge that the research I'm about to talk about was funded by Gilead Sciences, mm -hmm. and I'm grateful for their support. Uh, um, uh, the title, as uh, was introduced, is uh, Evolutionary Analysis Reveals the Early and Multiple Origins of Metastatic Lineages Within Primary Tumors. So um, this has been a big topic uh, recently uh, since we sort of started doing a lot of sequencing of normal and primary, uh, normal tissue and primary tumor tissue. Um, the added question has been what's different about metastatic tissues, and there have been a lot of questions about the relationship between metastatic tissues and primary tissues, tumors. So I'm going to sort of structure this little uh, short talk in two parts. One part where I'm going to fairly quickly go through uh, the uh, arguments for how you can and cannot say something about the rel relationship of metastatic tumors to primary tumors. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about some research that we've done that says uh, something I think very interesting about the relationship between metastatic and primary tumors. Um, so I'll just start without going through these in any detail, but just to mention that a lot of recent studies have begun to perform tumor, tumor phylogenetics, that is understanding the genetic relationships between uh, tumors and uh, metastases and the normal uh, tissue within a patient. Um, and uh, evolutionary analyses have typically been applied to perform very deeply historical science as opposed to this sort of uh, uh, evolution going on uh, in real time within people. Um, and I'm not going to go into much detail of that, but except for that uh, evolutionary tools uh, you know, tell us about the origin of life and, and these large-scale problems uh, traditionally, but they're beginning to be able to be applied to problems that are much more recent in time scale, partly because of the ability to do next generation sequencing and large scale sequencing so that even very few changes across an entire genome can be used to reconstruct the evolutionary divergences that occur, such as in the case of the somatic evolution of cancer. So f some fundamental questions about cancer are immediately addressable by phylogenetic analysis. In particular, uh, you might be interested in the spatial and temporal heterogeneity in cancer or tracking the origins and drivers of uh, metastatic expansion in cancer. Um, and in the, the, the issue, though, is you have to be very careful about what you uh, assume comes out of a phylogenetic analysis. So I'm going to give you a very short course on like, how to interpret a phylogenetic tree here. Um, the point is, one question that, of course, we would very much like to answer is the question of whether metastatic sites at metastases at different sites arise independently from a primary tumor or give rise to each other. So on the left, we have a, a model of par parallel metastatic events from a primary here in the breast going to lung, liver, bone, and brain. Uh, and on, on your right, uh, you see an initial met metastasis from primary followed by what is called a metastatic cascade where spread from the metastasis actually led to further metastases. So uh, that sounds like something that would be directly addressable by a kind of phylogenetic analysis, um, but I'm going to go through how it's actually quite challenging to address it um, under, at least with the kinds of data gathering we can do today. So. Um, one paper, for instance, that attempted to do this was a paper by Schwartz et al. that concluded high-grade serious ovarian cancer exhibits metastasis, metastasis spread. And the way they did this was by, by looking at the frequency which, with which they uh, achieved certain types of phylogenies compared to others, looking at these meta metastatic tumor tissues and comparing them to the primary tumor. So here you see uh, um, one topology that they got, which was a star topology where the primary tissue um, was sort of at an origin, and you saw the divergent other kind of tissues uh, going off in other directions. And this is the actual research result. This is just sort of a diagram for your comprehension. Um, um, and that was only in one out of nine cases, whereas in eight out of nine cases, they saw a tree structure to the phylogeny that they inferred. Um, and they take that tree structure to imply that there's sort of a divergence event and then subsequent divergence events leading to the separate metastases in this tree. Uh, now, I want to quickly sort of Take, take you through the basis for making such an inference or for why you shouldn't probably make such an inference from such data. Um, and uh, I'm going to use a different kind of tree structure. I hope you guys can get your heads around these. So, so here we're just talking about we have an origin here, which would be the normal tissue. And then these A, B, C, D are primary or metastatic tissues. In this case, uh, I've labeled the blue square as the primary and these three as metastatic tissues. And what we see here are parallel metastatic events from the normal. So, so what we see is that the primary is closely related to one metastasis here, and there's two other metastases here. Uh, and so that's the attribution. So, so 
the assumption is that parallel metastatic events would result in one tree topology, whereas the metastatic cascade would result in another. And what I'm about to show you in the next slide is that that's not a valid assumption. So how I can show you that is by sort of showing what could be hidden underneath that tree. So for instance, right here, this circle is meant to represent the entire primary tumor. So of course, there's a phylogeny relating all the cellular lineages within the primary tumor. And then there's a phylogeny relating the metastases separately to that primary tumor. And so if we have a primary tumor and we sequence some lineages and not all of them, you can get different trees out of it. So for instance, in this first example, we have A, E, F, and G as lineages that are here, but we have not actually sequenced those. What we've sequenced is B, C, and D. Um, are, I'm sorry, so supposing that we have not sequenced, um, uh, so without sampling the F and the G lineages, if you don't happen to sample those lineages, but sample A, E, B, C, and D, what you get out of a, uh, out of a phylogenetic tree in analysis would be A and E closely related to each other and B, C, and D closely related to each other. And that's because all these meta metastases were closely related to each other. Now that's the kind of conclusion you might have come to under the reasoning from Schwartz et al. However, what I want to point out is um, you could also have B, C, and D each emerging separately and independently from this internal phylogeny. And those separate and independent emergences, if we didn't sequence F and G, would come out looking exactly like a metastatic cascade where it actually in, uh, implied completely independent metastases from the primary tumor. So you can't take the genetic relationship, is, the bottom line is you can't take the genetic relationship among these tumors as telling you anything about the, or, the order of spread, right? That's a physiological or physical process, and the genetic data, although it has some implications about it, really can't give you direct evidence about that. Now I'm going to contradict this, not contradict this, but I'm going to add to this with some research where we did some interesting things on this topic um, after I finish just going through this top, the, the, the little lesson here. So we get the tam same tree despite fundamentally different histories, therefore the tree is not distinguishing those histories. Um, so I've been through this uh, and I don't have too much time. The one thing I want to emphasize is that um, in these studies they did quite a lot of uh, tumor sampling from the, from the uh, sorry, sequencing of bits of the tumor. The unfortunate thing is we never know how many primary clones we're missing. So even if you sample quite a few, if you leave large portions of the primary, tr primary tumor unsampled, you're not going to be able to figure out whether the individual metastases are closely rela close related to primary tissue or other metastatic tissue because the close, closely related section in the primary tissue might be the part you didn't sample. So essentially the lesson is what we really need are technologies that do uh, very large scale sequencing of many cells within the primary tumor, then we could probably sort of ascertain this kind of question. But until we do that, uh, sampling, you know, separate re a bunch of separate regions is unlikely to give you the level of resolution needed to make these conclusions. So deep NGS on a large portion of the tumor is possible, might be helpful, followed by accurate phasing algorithms, which is an issue of bioinformatics that I think is not resolved right now to distinguish the subclones. Uh, sampling of a very large number of small spatially separated regions of the tumor might establish it. Or um, I think probably the most promising option would be highly parallelized single cell sequencing from entire tumors or from spatially heterogeneous samples of a single tumor. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to shift to some of the research that we've done on uh, this topic, looking at metastatic lineages that can arise early and exhibit multiple genetic origins within primary tumors. Uh, what we did was to whole exome sequence 139 sites of metastases plus normal and primary tumor tissue from autopsy. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, what we've done here uh, is just show you the different uh, tumor types that we sequenced, the number of uh, individuals and cases and the number of metastases here that were sequenced. So in most cases we had two or three or four, in a couple cases we had six or seven. Uh, we had largely a uh, large data sets especially for lung, pancreas, uh, and a little bit for head and neck and breast, um, and then a smattering of other tumor types. And we had very good uh, next generation sequencing. You'll hear more about this in the second ground rounds uh, today. Um, a phylogenetic analysis, uh, as I said, can address these questions about the timing and relationships of metastases. So even if we don't know about metastasis, metastasis spread, there's a lot of interesting things we can figure out. Are there single or multiple genetic origins of metastases within the primary tumor? That we can actually assess. How, do, how early do metastases genetically diverge? What is the chronology of cancerous tumor origination? And do driver mutations occur early or late in cancer? 
So uh, I don't need to go through this in detail. I just want to mention that we concatenated all the single nucleotide variants, constructed phylogenies robustly by multiple inference procedures. There's a long established tradition in evolutionary biology about how to do this, and we followed that tradition. Uh, inferences were consistent with uh, loss of heterozygosity. So um, if you look on the left, these are two actual tumor trees of multiple metastases and the primary in red. This is the normal tissue as the ancestor. And what you can see is that there's a diversity of relationships of the metastases and primary tumors. This primary tumor tissue, of course, was just one piece of the primary. So it doesn't tell us what all of the primary is like. It just tells us that at least one piece of the primary is closely related to these, closer related to these metastases than to this one. And at least one piece of the primary is closer related to this adrenal uh, metastasis than to these ones. That's what you can take from these trees. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that if you look at where heterozygosity was lost, it's consistent with this tree. That is, when you see a loss, it tends to apply to all of a clade of metastases. So we have uh, robust results from our analyses. Um, two model predictions that are out there is there's a long-standing linear model of cancer progression that suggests a single metastasis adapted descendant lineage in the phylogeny of tumors from each patient. Uh, uh, in contrast, a parallel model is being increasingly favored, consistent with multiple genetic origins of metastases. Uh, and so we wanted to test that with our data. And the way we did this was to basically count phylogenies. So what, what you can do is you can look at the number of tumors obtained, and that gives you a prediction for how often you should see the primary as the outgroup, that is where it's more distantly related to the two metastases than they are to each other, uh, compared to when it's an in-group, that is when, it's, when the piece of the primary is most closely related to one other metastasis uh, compared to the other metastasis in either of two relationships. So when you have just three uh, tumor tissues obtained, uh, primary and two metastases, and then the normal, uh, there are one, two, three different trees that you could relate to those three samples. So your chance of having the primary as an outgroup, if there were no particular predilection for metastases to be closest related to each other, you would expect one out of three of these trees to give you a primary as an outgroup. Right? Whereas if metastases tend to be more closely related to each other, you're going to tend to get these types of trees more frequently, and more than two-thirds of the trees, if they tend to be more closely related to each other, will be in the, of these kind. So you can sort of do the math here. I'm not going to do that for you, but you can project for each number of uh, tissues that you obtain what you expect. And to just give you the result, a linear model for all cancer is not supported. Uh, some genetic, epigenetic, and uh, physiological disposition toward metastasis is. So of the 16 cancer phylogenies featuring a well-supported topolo topological position of the primary tumor, six or 38% exist, uh, exhibited a most likely topology in which the metastatic lineages were not monophyletic. That means where the metastatic lineages had some primary that was more closely related to some of the metastases than to others. Um, and that just means that the primary tumor was not the outgroup to all metastases one lineage didn't depart from the primary tumor and give rise to all the metastases. Uh, so integration over the Bayesian posteriors, that is where we took not just the phylogenies we knew for sure were really robustly estimated, but also took those ones that we had some information on and weren't quite sure about, uh, yielded about 45%, and this constant interval for that is overlapping with the, with the sort of sure things. Um, and that value is quite a bit higher than the random expectation. That's that expectation if primary was just distributed at random among those possible trees uh, of 21%. So that demonstrates that these heritable genetic or epigenetic or other lineage specific events can contribute a proclivity within lineages toward metastasis from the primary tumor. However, that lineage specific effect is not so strong as to universally lead to monophyletic metastases as would be predicted by a linear model of cancer. So it violates the linear model of cancer. It says there might be some genetics underlying that, but it's not super strong, or else we would have seen again and again and again the metastases most closely related to each other and not to the primary. All right, so um, that's interesting. You can so take some other things from these trees. So ge the genetic divergence of metastatic lineages from primary tumors can occur early in tumor evolution. So in, in some cases, we actually see the metastases diverging uh, quite early. In other cases, uh, the metastases diverge quite late from the primary tumor. What I've, in these diagrams, the blue line was the time of diagnosis. The primary is, um, this is actually time, uh, but it's sort of scaled so that everyone exists from a normal to death scale. And the point is that uh, B, um, so the blue line represents diagnosis, uh, the red line, um, uh, sorry, the red line represents diagnosis. 
the blue line represents when metastases actually diverge from each other. So the interesting thing that you can take from this, um, and I can go into detail about how we did this, it's quite complex, but also very well, the, the mechanisms we use for this are very well established in the evolutionary biology community. Uh, for dating sort of how deep these nodes are based on the genetic data that we had. And so what you can see is often we dated uh, metastases as diverging quite a bit before primary, uh, uh, before the primary tumor was diagnosed. And this is just a probability density diagram showing it. We often see the first genetic divergence of the metastases. So that isn't metastatic spread, but the first genetic divergence of the metastases, that is that whatever genetics was leading to the metastatic spread seem to occur prior to diagnosis in many cases. So um, we already have the genetic potentiality for metastasis that argues in many cases, not necessarily in all, uh, at the time of diagnosis. Okay, so these lineages can be sampled um, and sometimes they arise subsequent to diagnosis. So in some cases, diagnosis of the primary occurred uh, and then we saw divergence of the metastases. Uh, and these are the time scales over which we inferred these to, to look. I don't have the error bars on here, but I do have them if everyone who is interested in them. Uh, so this is about 12 years back, uh, 42 months back. We see the, the uh, first divergence of, uh, the gen of, the normal t of the primary tumor from normal tissue. Um, and metastatic lineages sampled also often arose prior to diagnosis and resection. So this is a case where what we see is all of the metastases genetically arising, their differentiation of genetically arising prior to the diagnosis of the primary, even though the metastases were not diagnosed at the time of primary. Okay, so metastatic lineages, uh, just one more example, uh, two more examples for you to look at. Um, again, here's an internal primary. Uh, here's a, another primary that's more closely related to a metastasis, uh, one metastasis than all the others. Um, and you can see going back about 13 years, going back about 23 years. Uh, it turns out that the number of years it goes back is often proportional to the age of the patient. Um, so those ones, patients who've, who are older tend to have longer histories to their cancers. Before they are. So the conclusions I want to take from this phylogenetic analysis about the timing and relationships are that the divergence of metastatic lineages from the primary can occur early as well as late in cancer histories. We did find some cases where one metastasis diverged very early compared to the rest. Uh, and that there are multiple origins of metastases within the primary tumor. We know that genetically, at least, there can be quite a diversity of different origins of the, of the meta metastatic tissues. Now, there's one other thing we can do with uh, analyzing these trees, and that is we can map known driver mutations to them, uh, to the tumor genus lineage prior to all tumor tissue, that is this lineage right here, or to the pre-metastatic lineage, that's this lineage right here, prior to all metastatic tissue. Now that's interesting because of course anything that maps back to this branch is going to be present in all descendant lineages. And anything that maps to this branch um, is uh, present for all the metastatic lineages. Now I've already told you that in the re previous research uh, I didn't see, there's sort of only weak evidence, there's evidence but weak evidence for uh, sort of genetic proclivity for metastasis. That is specific mutations that have to be necessary across cancer for metastasis. Um, and uh, so, but anyway, we still wanted to look to see if we could find some, um, some <coughs> mutations that arose in this lineage that might be conferring proclivity in metastasis. And we were very interested in knowing what mutations are arising here because those are the tumor genesis <coughs> mutations. Um, so, uh, and then we can map those and then across all of our patients and tally them up. And I just want to point out that it, it turns out that these tumor specific driver mutations are enriched during tumor genesis. So all the, if you just take some of the established lists, uh, Mobelstein 2013 and Lawrence 2013 of known drivers in cancer, many more of them occur in that early tumor genesis branch than later in the tree, even though there's a lot more genetic distance later in the tree. And you can compare those drivers to other genes in a, in a Fisher's exact test, and you get a very strong result uh, illustrating that a lot of the major gene, major drivers are occurring early. Uh, non synonymous mutations are also enriched in these driver genes in the tumor, tumor genesis branch. So we see they, they're not just getting mutated, but they tend to be mutated in ways that are more likely to cause uh, changes to the amino acid sequence. Uh, compared to synonymous changes in those known drivers and compared to other genes. So there's a lot of important evolution occurring very early in the evolution of tumor genesis. And there are a number of papers uh, arguing the same point coming out recently. 
So integration over uncertainty and timing can then yield probability distributions. And this is something I'm really prospectively excited about more than this result, which isn't quite as surprising as some might be. Um, so generally speaking, these probability distribution, so these uh, different, uh, what we can do is look across that timing of when these genes were mutated and integrate over them. So here are the examples of all the times at which different mutations uh, occurred, at least the median across that uh, phylogeny. Um, so for instance, P T53 was mutated very early here, very early here, and then in another case it was mutated sort of in the middle of the timeline, and one case it was mutated quite late. And we can integrate over that distribution of when these occurrences occur across patients to actually get a probability distribution of when these genes are mutated. And, and this is perhaps not too surprising that P53 and RAS, known to be very important drivers of cancer, uh, are showing up as mutated very early in cancer histories. PI3 kinase and K KM2D, uh, somewhat toward the middle. ALK and KM2C, both important drivers, but a little bit later in terms of when they play their role in cancer development. Now, the one issue with this result is that this is across a lot of different cancers, and there are probably differences among cancers. We know some differences among cancers. So this result has to be taken with a grain of salt. But what I would say is, I think a really important next step for us to do is to do this kind of profiling within cancer types and get really strong idea of what the order of driver mutations are from a sort of fairly hard inference based on these phylogenies as opposed to the sort of softer sort of, we see this at high frequency, it must be an early mutation. The reason why you can't make that inference directly of high frequency early is because if it has a very high importance, but that high importance occurs only later in the development of the cancer, you would still see a high frequency at the time of resection, but it would be because of its a high importance, not because it happened early. This is all about happening early and does not have any, you know, the phylogeny doesn't tell you how important it was. It only tells you whether it was early or not. So I think there's a lot of potential there. All right. Uh, with that, let me just thank the people who, uh, who are responsible for this work uh, primarily. Um, in my lab, uh, Suming Zhao, uh, who you can see here, led the entire study um, uh, as we did all the evolutionary analysis of the, uh, of the tumor tissue. Stephen Gaffney processed the, so she did the tumor trees, for instance. Stephen Gaffney processed the data at a um, in terms of curation and making sure everything was really, really good, which we had to do a number of times. Uh, Atala Il Marino did the chronograms, um, and I want to thank Brian Zhao and Richard Lifton, who did the original sequencing and the very first analyses on this data. Yao Ai Bai and David Rim, who provided the, uh, all of the patho pathology expertise necessary to do it. And Joseph Schlesinger, who, um, who was interested in getting these results from the beginning and, and provided the funding for it. Uh, and also Max Spack, who uh, helped us out at one point um, with some similar results. And as I said, the funding for this was from Gilead Pharmaceuticals. Thanks. That's all I have to say today. <laughs>